Tonight, the extraordinary account of a Canadian detained by China. Michael Kovrig describes what he calls life on the edge of existence. That sense of confinement combined with constant surveillance really gets into your skull. And his perspectives on a regime he calls ruthless. The panda mask has fallen off. We can see the dragon underneath. Sharp escalation between Israel and Hezbollah. The deadly barrage and urgent pleas for civilians to flee. Those rockets and missiles are aimed directly at our cities directly at our citizens. A high-profile murder trial of a Toronto rapper wraps up even before it begins. It's you freed me! You freed me! Yeah, I'm home! Plus the price tag of filling a shortage, what private nurses in the public system could be costing Canadians. It's not within the, the overall mission of trying to provide the best care for everybody. And sporting the maple leaf across the pond. It's like winning the lottery, I think. The underdog soccer squad looking to score big with the Canadian touch. It's a night that you'll remember forever. CTV National News with Omar Sachedina. Good evening, everyone. He spent 1,019 days in Chinese detention. And tonight he is sharing his story with us for the first time in his own words. Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor landed back in Canada more than three years ago after being held separately by China on allegations of espionage. It was an apparent retaliation for the arrest of Huawei exec Meng Wanzhou in Vancouver on December 1st, 2018. Nine days later in Beijing, Kovrig was returning home from dinner with his partner, who was expecting, when his world changed forever. And that is where our conversation began. They grabbed me and, in front of my pregnant girlfriend, dragged me into a black SUV, stuffed me into the back seat, put a set of handcuffs on me, blindfolded me, and drove off into the night. And you, you can imagine what that was like for her. Right? She doesn't know if she's, you know, it's, it's an abrupt shock while she's pregnant, and she doesn't know if she's going to see me ever again. A terrifying 45-minute journey. They drove me to uh, some secret location in South Beijing um, and sat me in an interrogation chair and told me that I was under suspicion of harming the national security of China. And you're locked into a chair which, with a kind of board over the front of it, over your legs, that's locked, so you can't get out of the chair. After a while, your back and your hips and everything get excruciatingly uncomfortable. Um, and they're putting the bright lights on you, and they're just hammering away at you with questions. They're gaslighting you. And by that, I mean that they're actually drawing you into a world day after day, minute by minute, hour by hour, in which up is down and black is white and night is day and you have wronged them when in fact it's you know, it's a hostage taking in reality so at that point did you think that okay i may not ever get out of here again uh, yeah i don't know if i was thinking about forever necessarily but you know after a certain point in time right many years starts to be forever he was in solitary for five months no daylight and his food rations cut he says if he didn't cooperate it's, it's psychologically exceedingly difficult to deal with. And how, how do you even begin to stay mentally strong in that state? Lack of other alternatives. Um, you know, people sort of ask me, you know, how did you have the determination to do that? I had the determination of no choice. I had had interest for years in Stoic philosophy and Buddhist philosophy and in ways of managing your mind, basically. And I had dabbled in meditation, uh, done some yoga, and I doubled down on all of those things. I told myself sort of really early on that uh, you know, they're never going to see me cry. Um, they're not going to see me being weak, because if they do, they'll exploit that. Outside the walls of detention, a diplomatic battle was intensifying between Canada and China, Kovrig unaware of the extent to which he was being used as a human bargaining chip to secure the release of Chinese exec Meng Wanzhou. Gradually over time, I was able to kind of piece together the breadcrumbs and figure out that this was quite a big deal and very public. Ultimately, his time in Chinese detention lasted more than a thousand days. Having had the benefit of some perspective now, mm -hmm. do you feel like Canada did everything it could to free you in a timely manner? 
I think once the crisis started, there was no lack of effort by the Canadian government's part. I think the challenge was, the, the, the biggest challenge was that they were unprepared for it, that they underestimated the Chinese Communist Party and they underestimated its ruthlessness and its capacity to use any tactic like that. The panda mask has fallen off. We can see the dragon underneath. A lesson, he says, became clearer for him while he was in detention, where the possibility of seeing his daughter, now five years old, gave him the strength to push forward. Uh, we called her Clara uh, after my grandmother, but also because sitting in a situation like that, trapped in a cell in darkness, I wanted to always remind myself that we need to try to see clearly. Focusing on Clara's future, helping Kovrig manage a painful past. Fascinating conversation. And a reminder, you can watch the full interview on our website, ctvnews.ca. To the deadliest day of Israeli strikes in Lebanon in nearly two decades and a dramatic escalation of tensions. Lebanese health officials say nearly 500 people have been killed and more than 1,600 wounded as Israel expands its assault on Hezbollah. Hezbollah also claiming its deepest strikes inside Israel as fears of a wider regional war grow. CTV's Adrian Gobriel reports. Streaking through the night sky, Israel's Iron Dome missile defense system was thrust into action tonight over the port city of Haifa. As it intercepted multiple rockets fired by Hezbollah from Lebanon. Inside that country, the echo of war and plumes of smoke marked the deadliest day of fighting between Israel and Hezbollah in nearly two decades. Israel's rockets were delivered with a message from Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to those living in southern Lebanon. Get out of harm's way. I urge you, take this warning seriously. And thousands have. Gridlock took hold as families fleeing to northern Lebanon made the slow, desperate commute. <laughs> this man saying strikes, warplanes, destruction. No one is left there. Everyone has fled. Many are headed to Beirut. The Lebanon's capital city has also become a target in recent days. Netanyahu blaming Hezbollah for using members of the public as human shields. It placed rockets in your living rooms and missiles in your garage. Those rockets and missiles are aimed directly at our cities, directly at our citizens. Sunday morning, Hezbollah claimed responsibility for this attack in northern Israel. This has now become a full-fledged war between Israel and uh, Hezbollah. Israel's defense force claiming that in the last day alone, it's been able to hit more than 1,300 Hezbollah targets. The spark that ignited this latest round of warfare, Israel's ongoing response to the October 7th attack by Hamas, who are still believed to be holding roughly 100 hostages in Gaza. With the growing threat of a wider regional war, the Pentagon confirming today that more U.S. military personnel are being sent to the Middle East. There's about 40,000 U.S. troops currently in the region. Omar. All right, Adrian, thank you. And there was a plea at the U.N. today for both sides to stop the violence. Step back from the brink. Stop the escalation. We have, the, we have mechanisms through which to address uh, these issues. There is no military solution at this point that will make anyone in, in either country any safer. Also at the U.N. today, a high-stakes gathering of global leaders kicked off. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau urging them to come up with a plan to address the growing humanitarian crisis in Haiti, a country suffering from gang violence, hunger and political instability. CTV's Mike Lecouture reports from New York tonight. And we must come together with a serious, viable plan. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau called on world leaders to speed up progress and meet the urgent humanitarian needs of Haiti. At a high-level meeting focused on the island nation, Trudeau underscored the need for more help. So I call upon every nation here and every nation not here uh, to do their part as well. Those words after a meeting with Haiti's acting prime minister and after United Nations envoys returned from the Caribbean country, warning that a UN-backed mission targeting gangs lacks staff and funding. The situation is still very shocking. It's, uh, there's a huge amount of poverty, a huge amount of displacement, people in the streets, people not having anywhere to live. In June, a report from the UN said nearly 580,000 people were displaced from their homes and many parts of the country face shortages of food, water and medical care. 
Despite that, Ray says progress is being made in the capital of Porto Prince, where the criminal gangs are centralized. We also have a new multinational force that is in place, and we have Kenyan forces that have been deployed. Is that enough? No, it's not enough. Can we do more? Absolutely. One idea being floated in the lead up to today's meeting was to turn the Kenyan led effort into a formal UN peacekeeping operation. Canada supports the idea, but it's out of our hands. So after going through three drafts of a motion in the Security Council, Russia and China are not interested in that. And one former ambassador to Haiti says the current ad hoc mission has not been ideal. And it's a little bit like trying to design and assemble a plane while we're already. While Canada continues the push for more donations from other countries to solve the humanitarian and security crisis, Minister Jolie says we will not provide boots on the ground. Instead, she says, Canada will give funding. Omar. Michael Couture in New York. To a developing story out of Montreal late tonight, a lockdown notice for residents near the port of Montreal has been lifted after fire crews were able to extinguish a fire in a shipping container storing 15,000 kilograms of lithium batteries. CTV's Quebec Bureau Chief Genevieve Beauchemin joins us from the scene with more. Genevieve. Yes, Omar, people who had been told to shelter in place, to close their windows, their doors, to shut off their ventilation systems, as well as people who had to, been told to evacuate their homes are now being allowed to go back to their homes. It was really a very tense and tricky situation here on the ground with even a lot of power outages, traffic lights were off, people had been told not to be out on the streets, and firefighters had to deal with the situation for several hours. There were special crews that were brought in from the airport. They brought special equipment, which allowed firefighters to get to the root of this lithium lithium battery fire and to extinguish it that took several hours and they were very concerned about the situation the smoke that was pouring over the city around the area of the port of Montreal for several hours but now they're saying that they believe they have things under control the fire is not completely out of the moment but they feel that it is under control that people can now go back home Omar. All right, Jen, thank you. Headley frontman Jacob Hogard pleaded not guilty to sexual assault charges in a northern Ontario courtroom today. Hogard was charged in 2022 in relation to an incident that allegedly took place six years earlier. Opening arguments in the high-profile trial are expected to begin tomorrow. A Toronto rapper is free tonight after spending three years in jail. Top Five, whose real name is Hassan Ali, was charged in the shooting death of a 20-year-old student. But in court today, the judge ruled some key evidence inadmissible, causing the prosecution to stay the case. CTV's John Woodward has the details. <laughs> you freaked me! Me, I'm home! That's Hassan Ali, known as rapper Top Five, leaving court a free man for the first time in more than three years. Hope they find whoever did that. I'm an innocent man, you know what I mean? Ali was wanted in 2021 for the shooting of 20-year-old college student Hashim Omar Hashi, gunned down in what appeared to be a case of mistaken identity. Ali accused of being a member of the Go Get Em gang, the third man in this vehicle. The alleged motive, revenge for the killing of Ali's brother Saeed Ali, known as Foolish in 2017. But Ali didn't surrender. He went underground, taunting police and proclaiming his innocence on social media live streams. I ain't do shit. Everybody know I ain't do shit, but save that for God. After he was arrested in Los Angeles, he filmed part of a rap video behind bars. Among the evidence, authorities were expecting to use a rap lyric. I was 18 when I bought a gun. 22 when I shot your son. Uh. Prosecutors conceded there was no chance of convicting Hassan Ali after a judge ruled his rap videos and lyrics were inadmissible. Ali sitting in court couldn't believe it, saying, I get to go, and then is this a joke? As his family started crying. I think the evidence um, against um, Hassan was uh, entirely circumstantial. Ali claimed the Go Get Him gang is just a record label and denied those lyrics had anything to do with Hashi's murder. It's important for all drillers to, perceive, to portray themselves as the biggest, baddest gangsters on the planet. That's what sells. Hassan, are you worried about your safety? Safety? No, I'm worried about making a million dollars tonight. Online, he thanked Toronto that? rapper Drake for paying his legal fees that helped Top 5 beat a rap. He says he's going back to making music. John Woodward, CTV News. 
Last night, in a report on this broadcast, we presented a comment by the official opposition leader, Pierre Polyev, that was taken out of context. It left viewers with the impression the conservative non-confidence motion was to defeat the Liberals' dental care program. In fact, the conservatives have made it clear the motion is based on a long list of issues with the Liberal government, including the carbon tax. A misunderstanding during the editing process resulted in this misrepresentation. We unreservedly apologize to Mr. Polyev and the Conservative Party of Canada. We regret this report went to air in the manner it did. Coming up. Every morning, every shift, there's a nurse manager somewhere that has to fill a shift and there, there's no one to call. The soaring cost of private nurses in the public sector, plus a small Canadian connection hoping to pay off on a big soccer stage. The pandemic and difficult working conditions have caused many nurses to leave their jobs, a void filled by the private sector. And tonight, we're learning how much it's costing. CTV's Judy Trin reports. Since the COVID pandemic, public health care facilities, from hospitals to long-term care homes, have become increasingly reliant on private agencies to deal with nursing shortages. Every morning, every shift, there's a nurse manager somewhere that has to fill a shift and there, there's no one to call. So it's a lot easier for them to call the 1-800 number and get an agency nurse to come uh, regardless of the price. That dependency has turned into a costly addiction, according to the Canadian Federation of Nurses Unions. In 2020, public health care facilities were spending about $250 million annually on private nurses. That will balloon to $1.5 billion this year, a 600% increase. Data from Statistics Canada shows that on any given day, more than 43,000 nursing jobs are vacant. The study's author, a former nurse, says money needs to be put back into the public system. Imagine what we would be doing with $1.5 billion. You know, what strategies could have been put in place for retention of nurses? What, what quality of care could have been provided? The average wage for a public sector nurse is about $65 an hour similar to what private agencies charge in Manitoba. But in Ontario, some agencies charge $195 an hour, and in Newfoundland, Labrador, a whopping 312. There are more than 470 for-profit nursing agencies across the country. The owner of one private company says exorbitant fees do need to be reined in. That greed um, is not within the, the overall mission of trying to provide the best care for everybody. Advocates want these private nursing agencies regulated and limits put on how much they can charge. But Omar, their end goal is to push the federal government and the provinces to phase out these private nursing companies altogether. All right, Judy, thanks. Still ahead, a bitter legal battle in Saskatchewan over a contentious pronoun policy. A legal challenge over a classroom pronoun policy was back before the courts today in Saskatchewan. CTV's Alison Bamford on the divisions and the issues. Bullied, discriminated and misgendered, Saturn Struble says he struggled for years of his childhood trying to fit in. It was very hard. I struggled with a lot of mental health issues and I felt like I was alone. But now he identifies how he wants, and this year was able to change his name in the school system without his parents' permission. I know a lot of people may not have supportive parents as much as I do. Saskatchewan's Parents' Bill of Rights requires parental consent before any student under 16 changes their name or pronouns at school. It became law last fall when the government invoked the notwithstanding clause to override the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. We are in favour of parental rights 
of involving parents, of including parents in, in key decisions and, um, and life decisions involving their children. The law is now before Saskatchewan's highest court after being challenged by advocacy group UR Pride. Arguments boiling down to one question. What is the role of the court once the notwithstanding clause is invoked? Our position, your pride's position, is that the court retains an important role when the government chooses to violate the charter rights of young people or any part of the population. The Saskatchewan government disagrees, arguing there is no role for the court now that the clause is in place. High stakes in what could be a precedent-setting case. New Brunswick is fighting a similar legal battle with its pronoun policy, and Alberta is expected to pass pronoun legislation in the fall. This is a new question. It really hasn't been considered before by the courts. Arguments continue tomorrow in front of a panel of judges who will likely take their time before making a decision once the hearing wraps up. Allison Bamford, CTV News, Regina. After the break, Canada aiming to leave a major mark on a big soccer match. A small investment is about to pay off in a big way for Newfoundland and Labrador. The province sponsored a lower league soccer team in England that will play a powerhouse tomorrow. CTV's Garrett Barry explains. An opportunity that legends are made of. It's like winning the lottery, I, th I think. Barrow AFC, which normally plays in front of 4,000 fans in England's fourth division, will next play for 40,000 when they take the pitch at Stamford Bridge against Giants Chelsea on Tuesday. But it's not just players and coaches that are eagerly preparing. Newfoundland officials are too. I believe there's a chanting section and a non-chanting section. I think I'm in the non-chanting section, I think. Because in front of all those fans and more watching on TV, Barrow will wear a Newfoundland and Labrador logo, part of a controversial partnership deal made this summer. That's going to be pretty prominent, I can tell you that. Newfoundland and Labrador are getting their money's worth out of that one for sure. <laughs> the provincial government bought a patch on the front of Barrow's jersey, spending $171,000 on the small soccer club for two years of promotion. The logo on the jersey is for a website promoting immigration to the province. We are targeting people who feel like they might not fit in the UK anymore, and we want to raise our hand and say, come to Newfoundland Labrador, and we need to be there in front of them when they're making that decision. Earlier this year, Barrow players crossed the pond and met with young counterparts in Newfoundland. And this downtown St. John's Bar is getting ready to show Tuesday's showdown. It'll be interesting. If they hold their own, that's all they got to do. It's all part of the magic of European football. Small teams can make Cinderella runs and take on the sport's biggest clubs. You know, it's a night that you'll remember forever, whatever the result. If, if they do manage to slay the giant, as it were, you know, that, that, that becomes the stuff of legend. All the more reason for Newfoundland and Labrador to cheer for its adopted team. A memorable highlight might put this Newfoundland and Labrador jersey into the history books. Garrett Barry, CTV News, St. John's. And that's a snapshot of this Monday for all of us at CTV National News. Thank you for watching. Good night and see you tomorrow.